our energy and food systems. But the EU Emissions Trading Scheme, which is implementing those higher level EU targets, uh, has us committed to a 1.7% reduction. And this is uh, a policy that is regulating approximately half of the EU's uh, CO2 emissions. Um, and that, that would be expected to continue past 2025 and reviewed no later than, sorry, expected to continue past 2020 to be reviewed no later than 2025 at present. And what I would argue is that when considering the types of policies that would give us a good chance of achieving these uh, climate change objectives, uh, we would not be looking for marginal solutions and optimization solutions, which is fundamentally what the market-based instruments uh, that the UETS is part of uh, are designed and, 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 and premised upon. We would be looking uh, at some very kind of substantial changes in the way we can produce and consume energy uh, and uh, the, uh, the overall structure the, and the infrastructure that's associated um, with our economy. So it also recasts our uh, discussions around energy policy from one that is currently, I would say, focused on supply side technologies, the, the questions that the kind of the over coffee, the, the, the um, over dinner questions that I get asked most are about nuclear power or they're about shale gas. Uh, and they're very much focused on our, the supply side of our energy system. But actually, if we were serious about climate change, we would be most interested in the demand side, the consumption side, where we can do things about our emissions in the very short term without requiring large-scale infrastructure transitions. So we would do that in the first instance. And then we would have always in our minds that we would have uh, very low to zero carbon supply available to us in the medium to long term. We would not leave, lose sight of that, but we would bring into the forefront uh, demand side measures. So um, I don't want to kind of leave this presentation on a, on a, on a downer, as it were. Um, have we got the agency to uh, achieve these unprecedented rates and to give ourselves that reasonable chance of avoiding uh, two degrees Celsius. Well, the IEA has proposed four for two, and there'd be four big headline um, policy frameworks that would be adopted and implemented elsewhere. So the first is that, they, that you would go hard on energy efficiency measures, uh, which has substantial economic benefits, which can be a problem as well, because you can get to what's known as rebound effects, where reducing the cost of energy services uh, enables people to uh, consume more in absolute terms. But the IEA uh, has made global estimates that 49% of savings could be achieved through these um, efficiency savings. You would act quickly to limit uh, the building of new coal power stations, so long-lived assets that have high emissions intensity and that would uh, lock you in by making large financial infrastructural commitments. You would minimise methane leakages from the oil and gas industry uh, which, although shale gas has kind of brought this issue uh, into the fore, it seems to be something that is common across hydrocarbon production and isn't just a, an issue of significant concern for the unconventional hydrocarbons. And that we would phase out subsidies on fossil fuels. Um, and, and, and that is a, a set of policies that are highly controversial, uh, not least in the non Annex 1 uh, countries. So, why, why would um, energy efficiency give you these big benefits and these big wins. Just quickly go through um, a, a kind of a crude sketch of uh, an electricity system. What we're interested in when we have um, uh, when we look at an energy system is that is, 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 is not energy commodities. People, you hear people talking about energy security as if it is about people possessing quantities of gas or tons of coal. But in actual fact, what we're most interested in as a society are the services that those energy commodities uh, supply us with. So heating, lighting, refrigeration, mobility, that's what we're interested in. So if we look at the energy that is realized in a service um, for, for a, a light bulb, and we work ourselves back in, through the supply chain to look at the quantities of energy at each stage back from the electricity that uh, goes into the light from the electricity that ultimately leaves the power station through the transmission system, and from the energy that is actually um, 
included in the fuels that go into the power station, and then the energy that is associated with the production, extraction, and transport, you've got more than an order of magnitude increase in energy consumption at, uh, at, at the supply end, as you do from the provision of the service at the demand end. And so any reductions at this side are magnified back up through the whole system. This is something um, that um, we might seek to address by looking at performance standards that can give you um, a, a very uh, swift implementation of those efficiency measures. So we have some work, this is work done by my colleague Dan Calverley, and he has looked at uh, car emissions in the UK at present. And so the mean fleet is 175 grams of CO2 per kilometre, and new cars coming out of showrooms are approximately 150 grams of CO2 per kilometre. And there's a current European target to get that to 130. But you can currently buy a high-performance vehicle, a BMW 3 Series, and it's a horsepower, power, quite luxurious, quite uh, desirable, some would say, marketing men can make it that way. Uh, and that has performance substantially in excess of the uh, new cars uh, and substantially in excess of the, the targets for the future. In fact, if we look backwards, uh, well, so we look elsewhere for cars that are less high performance, we can get uh, greater reductions. Uh, and if we go back in time to 1998, we already had vehicles that were available that were much higher performance and that were still coming from premium German car makers. So if we set a minimum standard that no new vehicle in the UK would perform any worse than that BMW 3 Series, and then we incrementally ratcheted down each year the, the standard so that performance would be, would be driven, um, you could get an eight-year turnover in the fleet um, so that you achieve 90% uh, of vehicle kilometers with those new vehicles, and that would realize a 50% reduction in CO2 emissions by 2020, with no substantial transformation in the system or in the technologies, but just by uh, mandatory imp imposition of a performance standard. And so not even kind of specifying the types of technologies that are required by vehicle manufacturers, but simply that they would have to achieve a meaningful level of performance. Um, so, uh, just finally, if we think that 2 degrees Celsius looks too difficult, well then, what is our alternative? What is this 4 degrees Celsius? So, we might be able to achieve that with marginal changes, with 3.5% reductions peaking from 2020. Um, is this a more realistic policy? Well, 4 degrees is the global mean surface temperature rise. That doesn't mean that you would see that degree of change in any particular location. The global land mean would be higher, and then the hottest days would have increases uh, of the order of 6 to 8 degrees in central China, 8 to 10 degrees in central Europe, or 10 to 12 degrees in New York. So what may seem like quite a small and quite a banal figure, in terms of the weather that's experienced, can be quite a substantial difference. And this has uh, impacts in uh, other systems, substantially food systems and, and water systems, uh, that would have very meaningful impact uh, on uh, humanity and, and, and civilization. Um, so, this is a quotation that uh, Professor Anderson, our research director, regularly wheels out any time uh, that we would uh, feel disheartened. Uh, he repeats to us that at every level, the greatest obstacle to transforming the world is that we lack the clarity and the imagination to conceive that it could be different. Uh, and I would hope that uh, the environmental law community uh, would uh, bring some clarity and imagination and uh, draw on the scientific disciplines and help us to achieve a world where we do not exceed those dangerous thresholds and we do not uh, jeopardise uh, many people's lives and livelihoods. John, and that has helped provide the bulk of an essay I need to write. <laughs> well, we're happy to take some questions from the floor. Ned.
Ted Westaway, I'm a barrister. I just had, um, I was fascinated by your light bulb example. And, um, and I've heard it before, just, we need energy efficiency. And just looking at that, if I've read it rightly, the use, the light use, is a tiny amount of the overall sort of energy carbon emissions. It's the production of the light bulb and it's transport, everything else is much, much higher to say a different order. And in terms of energy efficiency, does that suggest that really we should be thinking about not consuming as part of energy efficiency? If I have a, a cupboard full of old light bulbs, is it better to use those up than to go and buy new renewable ones? If I have an old banger, is it better to drive my old banger and get it fixed, even if it's terribly polluting, than to buy a new BMW? And have, are we missing something by focusing on energy efficiency but not thinking about the consumption implications of it? Yeah, so thanks. That's a, slight, that's a slightly different issue to the one that I presented there. So the one that I presented there was tracing the amount of energy in the supply chain to deliver that light service. So that wasn't a life cycle assessment of the manufacturer of the light. I think it's a very good thing that you point towards. Uh, as to whether we should invest in new assets or just use existing assets left. Uh, now, there's no um, one-size-fits-all answer there. Uh, what I would generally say is that uh, in situations where you have uh, high use and regular use, uh, you would uh, tend to expect that replacement with a new, more efficient um, uh, asset, so a new uh, vehicle, one of the, you know, a whizzy new, or a um, new lighting system would actually realise a net benefit in the meantime. Um, but I don't, uh, I don't know if that, that is something that necessarily sits across the board. The other thing that you point towards there is the distinction between efficiency and conservation. So efficiency in itself doesn't say anything about the absolute quantity of energy and then hence emissions. That are, that, are, that are released. Um, what we need to have, if we do look to efficiency, are other measures to make sure that any increases in efficiency aren't just spun out through economic activity to being overall increases in absolute uh, quantities of emissions. Uh, and so conservation, i.e. Uh, keeping an eye on what is used, the quantities that are used, uh, and managing those in their absolute terms. Is, is important. Okay, thank you for your question, Ned. Are there any other questions? Okay. It's, it's very, thank you very much for your talk. It's very interesting you mentioned the, uh, this, so the demand side of things, because in my from it's been interesting actually listening to different lectures today. From what I can see, I can see a vicious cycle here because there, the supply is coming through because there is a demand for it. So definitely the supply will, will keep coming through because there is demand for it. So I was just wondering, what are your thoughts about how we can uh, look at you know, tackling issues from the, from, the, from the supply, from the demand side of things, whether there's any research or ideas that you, you, you have? So well, I'm, I'm pleased to say that the research community is beginning to pick up on this. There's been quite substantial funding in the social sciences for some new uh, end-use energy demand uh, centres. Uh, so you can, you can keep an, an eye on those. They'll, they just started work last year. Um, in terms of what we would do uh, as, a, as a society or as a, or as a, a policy community, uh, I think we would just pay attention to um, absolute quantities, sheer quantities uh, of use, rather than always assuming uh, that there is a, 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 an infinite supply of uh, material goods and an infinite capacity of the environment to absorb those pollutants. What we see with climate change is that we have um, uh, an infinite capacity to release pollution, but a quite finite capacity of the atmosphere to uh, absorb that without uh, leading to some very substantial changes that we would, that we would seek to avoid. Okay, thank you for your question, Harry. And this gentleman here. Um, 
I was just wondering, you picture the Manchester skyline just influenced me, the Hilton there. Um, I'm aware that this, sorry, buildings, building regulations in this country, um, intermittently they have to be revised to incorporate you know, more energy efficient, more insulation, more better light bulbs, etc. Um, because buildings, are physical things, are non-tradable, um, I guess you can sort of implement such things. But as you know, innovations and research and like the standards of technology get better, it's hard to like make it a national policy to demand that all products have this standard. As you know, innovation makes things more possible, cheaper. Um, I know you're not in innovation; you're in you know, research into climate change. But do you think there are adequate sort of mechanisms to make like product standards? Like, do you think they're advancing quick enough? Do you think that's somewhere that we should be looking? Um, My impression uh, is that building standards is one place where we do have a kind of a standards-led uh, approach to delivering technology and infrastructures. Um, I, I I get the impression uh, that they uh, that such standards have fallen out of favour in um, other aspects of the economy. And so that's, so harking back to uh, the title and the invitation about emissions trading, the emissions trading scheme was meant to be the headline policy because it was meant to be the most economically efficient way of delivering uh, reductions. Um, these market-based instruments, I think, may well have been uh, productive and appropriate to the problem that we started 20 years ago when we had a marginal problem to solve and we wanted to develop a, a least cost path to it. But I think we've just got ourselves to a situation um, where we need to be looking more to those, um, those regulatory standards that give us a lot more security and drive a more rapid transition in the economy. And I think this will be the final question to the gentleman in the check shop. I'm Chief, sorry. Um, I'm Jake White from Friends of the Earth. I want to ask you two questions if that's okay. Though the first one may involve more graphs, so it may be tricky. It was just again around energy efficiency, and I wondered if you could give us a rough idea, kind of scenarios of how the economics and indeed how the carbon reductions compare when you do more on demand and less on supply, and, and vice versa. Um, that's the first question. And then the sorry, and then the second question. Since everyone asked you about shale gas, I'm going to. Um, I just wonder if you could, we could tempt you to comment on that too. I, I, I do a certain amount of work in this area, and I guess what's in my mind, uh, the key factors, I guess, are no global deal on, on, on carbon emissions, um, displacement, not replacement effects, lack of clarity around use of CCS technology, and the notion, the, the, the clear recognition that some gas, for example, to support renewables is going to be needed under almost any scenario. Uh, so I'll start with the. Um, no, I will start with the manager side one. Uh, reducing um, uh, demand for energy matters in economic terms whether you are reducing uh, overall demand for conservation, in which case you would have a measure of uh, kind of a, a loss of service, and then that depends upon the kind of the economic methodology that you use to cost that loss of service. Uh, increasing efficiency is nearly always a very positive thing from uh, an economic measure. I don't know if that was the point you were drive, driving at, but, uh, and, that's, and that's why you get this problem with um, rebound, because in general terms, you can drive the economy faster and, and, and uh, increase overall consumption. Um, on the shale gas, uh, I think you generally captured the concerns that we would have from a, a climate change uh, perspective. Um, the uh, major problem is that it is fundamentally a high carbon fossil fuel, and that the relative benefits between uh, different sources of gas and gas versus carbon uh, are not of the order of magnitude that you would want to see uh, in achieving a genuine um, emission reduction. Then you also have to assume, like you say, displacement, replacement, uh, even if you uh, assume that there is a, a, a marginal benefit from uh, one to the other, uh, that you do actually keep another hydrocarbon in the ground. And in the absence of a global regime, um, either to keep hydrocarbons in the ground or to uh, globally restrict uh, emissions, uh, then 
wouldn't assume that necessarily um, using gas in one place over coal would mean that that coal does not get uh, consumed elsewhere uh, and, and lead to a net gain. So I did some basic assessment of um, the US emissions trajectories. And so this is just up to 2011. Um, we reckon that about half of the emissions savings through a switch in the US power sector from uh, gas, uh, from coal to gas, were exported to Asia and to Europe uh, and burned there. And due to inadequate caps in the EU ETS, led to increases in emissions uh, in our power systems. And so, no uh, substantial net global gain. Thank you very much for your question, Jake, and um, thank you very much for your time today, John. I think we all learned a lot of that. Thank you. day of really interesting discussions, debate, and uh, hopefully looking at things from new perspectives. And for this, we really have to thank our speakers and to uh, Professor William Howarth for being the moderator for the panels of today. Now, when we frame the theme for today's conference, uh, the role of corporations in... Am I good? Can you guys hear me? Yeah, yeah, okay. uh, when we frame the theme for the, today's conference um, about the roles of corporations uh, in the environmental crisis, the problem or solution, uh, we deliberately uh, phrased it in a, in a perhaps provocative uh, manner and maybe a little cheeky uh, because we wanted to try to get um, the thinking. It, it's not about uh, asking a naive question of um, whether big business is friend or foe, um, or rather it is about inviting discussions and, to, uh, and, and, and thought about the roles that corporations have or ought to have world that we live in today um, and, and, and what are re the repercussions uh, of us um, choosing one way or another in interacting with them. Uh, and as we have uh, heard from our various speakers today, uh, the dynamic relationship between corporations and the community and the various different stakeholders are very complex and, uh, uh, and include different um, factors. So uh, we see many corporations in, uh, going into CSR. We see that they are leading um, lots of really interesting projects. Um, there's the Global Reporting Initiative. Um, there's the certification for environmentally friendly products. Uh, there are pledges to detox uh, manufacturing processes, supply chains within certain targets. Uh, but really, I think we, we, we have been looking at the questions of, are these measures sufficient? Um, or, are, or do they lull us into a sense of uh, false security? Um, are we doing enough to change and to respond to uh, avert the dangerous consequences that we see um, in the IPCC's fifth assessment report? Um, you know, when we move on in our discussion to talk about uh, adaptation to climate change, um, you know, what goes down? What about the interests of the real peoples in real locations in other places in the world? Um, what about their voices? And is that factored into the global conversation? Uh, and and Peel uh, conferences care a lot about this, and this is what we care about in, in environmental justice. And so um, it's, it's this dilemma of um, uh, corporations being in a unique and special position today where they have the ability to effect change. And so we have this dilemma whether to give more power, to further empower them so that they can use that to do more good, to conserve and to protect and to rehabilitate our environment? Or do we clamp down on corporate power by um, with, with imposing more, uh, regulation or scrutiny? Uh, that's the dilemma. And so um, it's, it's, it's kind of like this. I, um, I think Judge Birometri uh, has some really beautiful parables. Um, I've just I just thought of the Avengers, right? Um, when um, Earth was under threat, the governments of the world had no choice and decided to get a band of ragtag people with dubious backgrounds but superpowers to come together and deal with this threat that we're facing. So um, it, it's a complicated situation. 
and leaving you with that mental image. <laughs> I would like to again thank our spot sponsors for their critical support. And I would like to ask for another round of applause for our superbly stimulating speakers. We would also like to thank you guys, our speakers, uh, for coming, for listening, for debating. We hope you found the conference as valuable as we did. Two final uh, expressions of gratitude. We wish to thank our, thank our wonderful Peel team, without which this conference would not have taken place. Uh, and credit also must go to our Board of Advisors, um, who gave us valuable guidance and trust. Uh, if any students that will be students for the next year that are interested in joining the Peel Committee uh, and making this conference next year, I might warn you against it, but please do, um, come speak to us about it uh, if you're interested. As well, anyone who might wish to sponsor the conference for next year so we can keep this going year after year. We are students who come together every year, new, uh, fresh batch with nothing to work from, so uh, yeah. Um, so now, we'd like to invite you to join us for a drinks reception, which will be held upstairs outside in the courtyard. Uh, please join us for drinks, lights, and some light ref refreshments, and to continue this conversation. To leave you on a final sustainable note, if you guys could please return your badges to us, we'd like to be able to reuse them for next year. Thank you. You recall with it because yeah. he told me that you didn't. No, no, we did, we did. Oh, it's okay. fine now, everything's yeah. done. So, how are you going to take the. Uh, I'll come and see.